Okay, everybody, we're going to obviously what looks like a pre-start. I promise I get started and I want to stick it close to that promise as possible. So um, we'll start with a little pre-chat uh, with Verizon. I have <laughs> Padmanabha Raja Gopalan, or Gopal, <laughs> and uh, Daniel Keppel with us uh, from Verizon, the Verizon Ventures side of things. And uh, I'm not going to take the wind out of your presentation. We'll not go right into it. So let's just start with the chat. Um, about what are some of the interest? Let me just. What are some of the interesting things you've seen developing in wireless over the past couple of years? What are some of the hot areas of interest? Well, I was actually at um, earlier in the week. I was at uh, the TechCrunch Disrupt, and then we had the Verizon Wireless Developer Conference mm -hmm. um, uh, the past couple of days as well. And you know, there's there's definitely a trend happening about um, user information being uh, consolidated and analyzed and and then reflect it back to the user so you can get kind of higher relevance out of the sort of the social graph and work information that's being led to you. And it's going to change the, kind of the, the way the user experience is, is managed. And there's also, likewise, there's also business productivity tools that help to kind of auto-manage the distribution of your information and content across cloud services. Yeah. And I think the combination of those things are going to you know, be reflected in the, the user experiences. It's uh, probably pretty true because we see that consistent with what, what Orange was saying earlier today and stuff about uh, massively analyzing this data and making something yep. useful out of this mountain of information. Yeah, it's to make it easier to manage the workflow on a personal basis and on a professional basis to, so you can only kind of keep track of this stuff but don't have to intervene on, on interacting with that data. Yeah, and, and just want to add to that, I mean, given what's going on in the social uh, networking arena and uh, the enabling of locations with uh, the smartphones, uh, also known as computers, right? Yeah. So <laughs> these days, um, uh, we see a lot of activity shifting from, or a lot of activity that was very targeted towards PCs. You know, users used to just shop using PCs, but we see a lot of activity around retail go, you know, emerging in the mobile side as well. So that's another trend we are noticing. Yeah. Um, you know, that must be while we're waiting for people to stream in, is it we can uh, go to Q&A in an odd kind of uh, upside-down <laughs> way. If anybody has any questions like to ask uh, of Verizon Ventures, feel free to put your hand up and we can take that as well. I'll wait for the room to fill. Um, so you, you talk about the crowdsourcing. What about things like um, or crowd, sorry, analyzing crowd data and making information uh, useful, useful output from that? What about LTE? What, can you, what, what are you guys finding with LTE networks? Are you seeing anything interesting in the usage of your network or any patterns coming out? What kind of, uh, what kind of new services are you seeing that enable? So I think it's a little early to say what sort of new services that are there. I think um, um, clearly the ad additional bandwidth and lower latency are going to lead to uh, better uh, video and music services. Yeah. Um, you know, for a, a better experience on uh, for users on that sort of thing, yeah. um, and you know, I think we're actively working on some BD relationships there to help, you know, bring a better value proposition to our users yeah. to exploit the network. Yeah, so I, I echo that. Um, streaming is one thing from a consumer standpoint. From an enterprise standpoint, there's a lot more you can do as well. Yeah. There's a lot of collaboration now, which will, you know achieve the quality that enterprises would want to achieve. Yeah. So that, that, that's also going to be, uh, and in fact, you'll also see one of the calls we are making is anything that helps us showcase the latencies yeah. and the speeds we achieve right. uh, through LTE is what we are welcoming. Right. So, so you mentioned the latencies being really important. So that's, I mean, a lot of people think, no, LTE brings faster Precisely. speeds. But they aren't aware of the fact that latency yes. and the implication that would have. So what kind of things does low latency enable? That well, kind of real-time communications in yep. general, right? I mean, any anything that has got to do with real-time is what latency would benefit out of. Yep. So, the, the, the next generation of push-to-talk, probably, <laughs> or, yep. or you know, voice over IP type yep. services, video communications, video chats. Mm -hmm. What about uh, mo mobile gaming? Uh, absolutely. I mean, th those there'll, there'll be a lot of interaction. Any anything that has got to do with real-time interactions. So that's what latencies would right. hugely enable. I think uh, you know, for those of you who don't know, we're just having a pre-chat to get a kind of quorum in the room. I promised we'd start, so we did. But uh, we'll do the full introduction and kick off uh, probably in a couple of minutes. I think we'll have enough people to get started. Um, so if anybody, as I said, anybody like to ask, throw up a question, we have one here. No, Mike, just throw it up and we'll repeat it. I would be curious to know where they see the FIOS and the whole home networking and those type of Where FIOS is going, you're going to have to <laughs> give me a little help what direction you mean. In terms of additional deployments? Well, it's a, it's a, the files deployments are, it's a uh, 
pretty expensive on a per user basis, the infrastructure needed there, and so and the ROI takes a while to get back based on you know customer acquisition. So I think the game plan is is continue to do marketing efforts where we already have uh, rolled past um, houses and and acquire new subscribers, and then selectively look at some additional markets. Uh, to begin uh, new uh, build out for infrastructure or overbuild for that infrastructure, but I think it's it's going to be very selective. I don't, I, you know, we haven't announced any new plans to do deployments, but it's certainly being considered. But but nothing's been announced yet with respect to that. Uh, FiOS is a pretty bold initiative. I mean, I always like it because you're actually sinking a lot of capital in with a very long term vision on on payback period. And that's, uh, that's kind of what a role I'd like to see telecoms you know, do more often. Yeah, it was really interesting being on the inside, seeing the decision making that led to that um, deployment. It was, it was impressive how fast people said, no, we're going to do this. You know, it was top down. We need to, we need to you know, skip all these interim architectures and go to the best infrastructure you can put out there. And now how do we make it happen? And it was just stunning how fast they, that rolled it out. And you know, it's, you're, you definitely uh, took advantage of that cost curve coming out, but it's still, um, you know, expensive infrastructure to put it's it also, out there. It's also opened up a lot of opportunity for partners uh, with respect to you know, IPTV solutions and to home management solutions and uh, home security as well, right? So. It, yeah, I mean, we uh, we actually had a, a portfolio company that's in the um, connected home uh, for home that was uh, uh, is working on on a solution. It got acquired by Motorola. I don't know which house it's housed anymore at Motorola, but. Um, uh, <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. They're still working on a, a solution, on some solutions there. And we also have um, uh, another portfolio company I, that I can't talk about that uh, is working on some really neat um, open source solutions that that leverage the kind of the, the connected home. All right. So I think I'll, I'll say we have a quorum now, and I'll, I'll formally introduce you, and I'll get out of the way. You have the slide sure. advancer, and uh, so let me go. You guys, I will. Uh, so everybody, for those of you who didn't notice, we were just having a pre-chat waiting for some people to roll in. Next up is Verizon. We're going to talk with their innovation people and their venture people about uh, what they're looking for in Silicon Valley and what they have to offer. Thanks, Thanks Derek. Uh, yeah, in case you're wondering who I am, I am that long name uh, up there. Um, so uh, uh, very nice thing to have after lunch, right? Refreshing thing to pronounce that name. So uh, there will be a prize for anybody who can pronounce that name right. So I actually represent the New Market Development Group, which is part of the... Uh, marketing organization within Verizon and we'll briefly walk through you know what we are and what we do and what I'm here to cover cover is uh, outside of our um, Verizon developer community which has been pretty active you know we it's been active from the brew days and, and it's even more active in fact I'm coming freshly off of the uh, conference we had in Las Vegas uh, so I'm here to talk about innovation programs that are in place outside of the Verizon developer community uh, that's what we'll cover today So what do we seek innovation in? You know, basically anything that leverages the key technology trends. In our pre-chat, you know, we covered some of these uh, thought processes. Uh, uh, basically what we're saying is uh, we want to we want to uh, seek innovation in anything that leverages the key technology trend, either whether it comes from us or anything that goes on in the industry. So 4G LTE, we just briefly touched upon, you know, uh, they, ha they are like the industry leading latencies and speeds that, that you know, everybody knows about. So anything that showcases the power of LTE, uh, the latencies and speeds, we're open to that. We covered a couple of them right now, real-time uh, applications, uh, streaming applications, or to name a few. Second thing is, you know, I'm in the Valley, which actually started the, uh, the smartphone phenomenon. Uh, anything that, that actually, uh, any enablers or services or products that showcases and creates the sticky value for smartphones is, is something that we are always open to and, and seeking uh, innovation in. Third thing is you know, driving the adoption of wireless into new classes of connected devices. Tablets is one of them. There's many more to come. You know, you'll start seeing a lot more uh, 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 expansion of wireless into uh, devices that, that you may not even have imagined. You know, our, our, our colleagues from um, uh, other carriers today earlier talked about M2M. That's one of them as well. 
then the other charter is uh, you know, any innovation that helps us bring wireless technology to new markets, not necessarily wireless related or anything that you could imagine to be wireless related. Some of them are, are, are named in there, you know, local commerce or mobile commerce and loyalty uh, rewards and programs, right? So anything that enables those, we are open to that. And mobile health, you know, whether it's personal health and um, uh, wellness, or it's ena is enabling the the healthcare providers to be connected ubiquitously, that those are those are areas we are seeking innovation in. And of course, you know, connected home, and we are open to any other ideas as well uh, that I may not have covered here. We don't know what we don't know. You have heard us saying, you know, can you hear me now for quite some time uh, from a network quality standpoint? We of course heard it back from a startup innovation standpoint. Can you hear me now? So. We are making some improvements in that regard as well. Uh, uh, we've talked about uh, a lot this morning, and I'm sure you've heard this multiple times, as to um, the fact that the telecom carriers are slow. Yes, indeed we are, uh, but, but we are making some improvements to make sure we address the concerns we heard from a number of startups and VC partners and other uh, uh, strategic partners as well. So we are streamlining the idea generation process. I'll walk you through uh, a couple of things that we're doing, including the new market development team, which was formed uh, a, few, uh, a few months, uh, almost a year ago. There are some other uh, colleagues of mine in the room, which I'll probably uh, ask or, or mention some names uh, later on. So that's one thing we are doing from an idea generation standpoint, streamlining that process. The second thing is we, we completely understood and, and continue to understand how time is of the essence for you, both from an industry uh, time to market standpoint, the value of the product, as well as you know, for our startup, you know, a three month is a lifetime versus compared to a telco, three months is just purely a, a testing certification process, which is part of a big one. So we completely understand the distinction and we are committing ourselves to making accelerated decisions. It could be a quick no, but we will tell it really quickly. And uh, then, when, uh, when an idea really you know, uh, is of interest to us, and there's, there's mutual interest, of course, we have identified some defined execution paths within Verizon, which we will uh, route the uh, idea or the concept or the startup through. So we'll, we'll walk through very quickly on that as well. So here, this is the broad set of activities, you know, some of which you, know, you, you may have been uh, exposed to as well. So just to mention that we are, we are no stranger to innovation. We have been doing a lot of things internally as well. There's a lot of services that we have introduced. You know, I'm not gonna go through each one of these uh, in, in gruesome detail. The point we're trying to make is there's a lot of activities that are in progress. And today we'll cover some of the innovation onboarding and idea generation uh, uh, scouting related uh, activities which is the, uh, the application innovation centers or the innovation centers in general. One in uh, Massachusetts, we'll cover that a little bit. And then uh, we have an initiative called uh, Innovation Day. We'll cover that. And then 4G Venture Forum, which some of you may have heard uh, uh, before from one of my colleagues, Samfrey Chen, uh, who's been pretty active in this area for quite some time. And then Verizon Ventures, the guy who won the AT&T phone in the raffle. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> uh, they were, Microsoft very kindly is going to get me a Verizon wireless phone, so <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, so bottom line is uh, innovation centers. You know, what, what, what are we trying to achieve? That I, I had a very interesting chat with a gentleman from, from Finland. You know, what is really your objective behind these innovation labs? Are you trying to show to the world that you, know, you, can, you, you can really do things that the internet service providers, or internet providers are doing, you know, or internet players are doing, which is you know, the big ones that you know, Google, Facebook, and so on? No, the answer is not really. We, we've, always been, we've always been more in-house uh, uh, development oriented, and what we're trying to tell the world and what we completely understand is we can't really bring every innovation by ourselves. So what we're here to say is, hey, these are the assets that we have, these are the, the resources that you have access to, come on over, use them to optimize the performance of your applications, your services, and also uh, in that process you may find similar applications or similar minds that gel with your thought process and we'll combine them and showcase it to our customer, whether it could be end consumer or it could be an enterprise or SMB consumer, so we will showcase it to them to see you know, what value our assets could add to the applications that you may already have. So that's the objective of the innovation centers. And we have two of them, uh, both of which were recently inaugurated publicly, but they've been in 
some of them ha activities have been going on for quite some time, especially the LTE Innovation Center, uh, which is up there in Waltham, Massachusetts, with you know all the state-of-the-art LTE equipment, and you'll also have um, access to some of our partners. And the Application Innovation Center up here in 200 Spear Street uh, in San Francisco, California, with actually uh, uh, each of the innovation center offering you know what is listed up here. You know, you are, they, they offer private engineering spaces, meeting rooms, access to both engineering, Verizon engineering resources, and business development resources for you to have any kind of strategy, business, go-to-market, or technical discussions. And the other thing, as I mentioned before, is we also can facilitate discussions. A lot of times, it's not always something that we can bring to market. We need a partner to play a role. You know, it could be Qualcomm, it could be an OEM, it could be some other technology partner. We'll also facilitate those discussions. You know, when, you know, whether you come through Innovation Center or not, we do that all the time. But this is another formal way of onboarding those. And then uh, I want to briefly touch upon IE Days. You know, Innovation Days uh, is, is an initiative that we've, we've had for quite some time right now. You know, it's been running from 2007. And uh, I, uh, I uh, along with a couple of other colleagues of uh, mine and based in the West Coast, Ed Ruth and Tom Villa, we actually uh, scout for about, just like a VC would, for about 200 to 300 companies. We talked to 200 to 300 companies in a span of about four to six months prior to the innovation day and bubbled them up to like seven to eight and put them in front of our executives, you know, our CMO and uh, other executives who, who were relevant to the decision making process. And this is an opportunity for a startup to really get the highest level exposure uh, to, to the Verizon executives. We do that, so it's a it's bottom line. It's a partnership pitch session, and uh, the next session is targeted for late uh, eleven or, or uh, early twelve. And some of the companies listed there are not necessarily all of them saw the light of the day from a time to market uh, from a market launch stand standpoint. But a lot of them are listed that are listed there did find, and some of them actually also uh, may have found some investments uh, from our ventures venture partners. The other, this is the other one. I'm not. Uh, th you probably, like I said, have heard from my colleague Humphrey Chen, uh, who's also part of the same group. Uh, this is a forum that we actually uh, form collaboratively with the partners that are listed there, uh, to kind of have a symbiotic relationship. You know, VCs always get these pitches on, you know, what this technology means to a carrier or to a new technology, uh, and uh, also they have some struggles with it without, you know hearing the real uh, thought process behind that. So we decided to collaborate since you know, we launched 4G uh, LTE for, you know, in, in the large, large scale that you all know. We collaborated with those folks, and we continue to collaborate in that area. This is more infrastructure focused. You know, probably, Dan, you can add some color. Sure, I mean, I think the, the, it's, it's generally a form. It's not actually a, a vehicle for deploying capital at, on the recommendations of the partners. It's an opportunity for the VCs to hear the story directly from the, the the engineering teams at, at Verizon Wireless and to hear where our needs are with respect to uh, the, for, for the LTE rollout. And at the same time, there's one or two um, uh, startups will get kind of vetted out with the group and it will just be kind of like a jumpstart the diligence. And I think there's only been one or two companies that actually got funded as a result of that, but it's a, it's a different sort of focus. It's really to be informative and, and for those, those venture partners. And, and there's probably and there's an expectation that the partners will move around so that we can continue to educate those VCs a little, a, a little bit more directly and they can uh, understand better what our requirements are for uh, technology development on 4G. So, so I mentioned earlier on as to how you know we are streamlining the idea generation process, and I mentioned I'm part of the new market development team. This is what we're doing. So we have a dedicated team with numerous team members. Some of uh, the team members are here: Laura Diaz and uh, Ed Ruth. Uh, you can you can uh, access them as well. Uh, I think Dave Vetstone, who's actually been uh, active part of the Telecom Carrier Council as well, he may be here too. Oh, he's right here. Okay. <laughs> so uh, th these are all folks that are part of the team, which actually uh, the objectives are listed right there. You know, we are the lead in terms of aggregating the new ideas, some of which could really, really blossom into great partnership opportunities, and they have. Uh, and uh, uh, the other uh, value we add is, you know, the, the rest of the team has, ex you know, really extensive expertise in market sizing, competitive intelligence, market research, and strategy. So we combine all those to really filter those companies and concepts to some things that really mean uh, uh, a lot for the end consumer, 
or to uh, or to the business itself or to the industry itself. And uh, what we also commit to is coordinating across different groups within Verizon to make sure this really moves and, and sees the light of the day in terms of market launch. We, we obviously get support from a, a, a lot of support from our colleagues, you know, the CTO organization, which has tons of resources uh, in these innovation centers. We work with a product development team, legal and finance teams to make sure uh, we, we actually uh, get it to market as soon as we can. Of course, uh, the other key partners are the corporate folks, uh, the VZ Venture folks. So the last slide I have, this is, uh, uh, this is basically just listing the possible options we have uh, in terms of uh, identifying you know, how a typical you know, concept or a product or a startup could proceed. If it makes sense, you know, we'll integrate it into a product portfolio if, if it's, it's a mutual uh, consent. And uh, uh, the other piece is you know, it could result in an equity investment if it is really strategic for us. Or you know, with the help of innovation centers, you could actually come and prototype along with us, and we're open to uh, considering NRE funds as well. And uh, there's a lot of distribu distribution and, and merchandising par partnerships that, that, that have evolved out of this team. But this is all outside of, uh, of course, the Verizon Developer Community Initiative, which is large. On to you, Dan. Okay, I'll, I'll stay. Uh, Derek, just a quick time check. How long? Like with a hand signal, okay? Okay, great. So. Boy, it's like hard to read from here, but <laughs> um, so I, I have uh, run Verizon Ventures for the past 10 years, and the models changed a couple, couple different times down the road, but in general, we're a strategic venture capital program for Verizon. We're, we're supporting the, the major initiatives of all the business units of Verizon. We're at the corporate level, so it's not just Verizon Wireless, it's global enterprises and the telco uh, in terms of looking at initiatives for them too. And we're basically deploying capital into specific companies that support those strategic initiatives. Um, we're, uh, uh, the, the type of companies that we're most interested in, in working with are ones that are gonna lead to a compelling commercial relationship between the startup and whichever Verizon business unit that we're interested in and uh, they're, they're working with. And so that relationship doesn't have to occur at the time that we're making the investment. What we'd like to have is a clear glide path as to what needs to happen to, for that um, relationship to mature. And so we deploy the capital, make the investment, and then we spend our time helping that company work with the business unit and to grow, grow the relationship and have it execute as fast as possible. So putting money in helps uh, the company by getting the capital to fund it, but it also the working relationship, it's a kind of another path for the company that's, deal, that's dealing with the, the, their commercial partners so that we can help kind of lubricate the relationship so it executes in a much, uh, uh, much quicker fashion. So um, these are uh, some of our portfolio companies. We won't disclose all of them, but uh, these, uh, they have a broad sample of them. I'd say if you look at the categories of investment that we've deployed most of our capital in, um, we've got investments in content, investments in networking, uh, connected home, M to M, M commerce are, are kind of the major buckets that we've kind of uh, 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 looked at and um, been much more active in the past uh, past couple of years here. We've uh, did seven new investments last year and eight new investments so thus far this year, with a couple more certain to come before the end of the year. So it's basically just two of us doing the deal activity, myself and Mark Smith. Carlos uh, helps support us in terms of the doing the diligence, but we rely on, on the rest of Horizon to help us in, our, in our, uh, our diligence activity. Now the advantage of our organization though is that our investment committee is the senior level, uh, the, the C team at, at Verizon. So once we make an investment, it's giving a much higher level of exposure to that for those startups at the C level. And in fact, when it's our strategic deals, we're actually looking for a, a de facto sponsor. So it's getting that in that uh, CMO or the CTO or whoever the, the relationship is structured with, getting them to actually step up and say, yeah, we, you know, this is a this is a good company that we should be investing with. So th they're going to be, uh, you know, at least have some motivation to be friendly to the company and help and help, you know, help me work with them to get get the relationship to work better. So that's a quick step. That's where you can reach us. I think the type of deals that we're looking at, it's generally a, a, a one to five million dollars in our strategic transactions. Uh, we're looking for 
it's usually a little bit later stage because we're it's got to be have that incipient relationship where we're expecting something to really take off so it's it's usually a, a more mature company we started doing some seed transactions less than a million bucks less than 10 million dollars valuation uh, those are still more the exception and that those don't need that engagement because you're looking at them to grow the business in a way that's that's consistent so it can kind of become a strategic relationship over time and that's kind of what we're doing that our investing uh, activity in a nutshell. Right. Is that the last slide? I think yeah. so. All yeah. right. So thank you very much. Okay. Well. <laughs> and we'll go to Q&A with the lights up and put your hand up and have uh, one of the microphones uh, run to you if you have a question. There's going to be one. He no, I thought you had a microphone, but you had a pen. <laughs> well, well, you're going to have to ask a question now. Anyways, I'll ask the first one. Um, I noticed that you use the VZ acronym instead of VZW. So to make a point, this is fixed and wireless combined? Yeah, yeah. All right. And also mentioning that uh, you know, we had Swisscom and Orange earlier this morning. I know my intro was largely wireless, but the Telecom Council and yourselves and those companies, it's fixed and wireless combined, both areas of interest. So what, um, what, on the fixed side, what kind of um, innovations, what kind of ventures are you, are you looking at? So we're uh, really looking at uh, kind of consumer experience to help leverage the Fios experience, make it unique against um, uh, the kind of the other um, uh, video offers that are out in the marketplace. Um, we do a lot on kind of core networking technologies that really get leverage across both the access networks yeah. and uh, uh, you know through Verizon's acquisition of Terramark and their cloud services uh, we're starting to look at a lot of the cloud services um, haven't made any uh, investments that we've announced at this point uh, but we're looking to to leverage some things there as well. So and you're, you're security services, I mean, there's a, just a ton of stuff that we're doing on a global enterprise level. Could you give an idea of what, like your time you split, how much of them are mobile opportunities and how much are fixed? Uh, I would say the majority of our investments are on the wireless side. I, you know, probably 60, 70% of them are on the wireless side. And certainly the, the majority, it, there's probably, a, a, that's deal-wise, capital-wise, it's even m more heavily skewed towards wireless. All right, we get, I didn't see if anybody got a microphone. Oh, this question over here. Uh, You'll have a mic in a second. Um, in general and specifically, can you talk about how FiOS and perhaps another carrier's uh, video service, if you care to include them, are, di are, are differentiating themselves qualitatively from satellite and cable and what they're offering people? I remember years ago, I don't cover this specifically very closely, I remember years ago going to a, 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 a TIE forum where uh, another national operator that was getting into this business offered uh, local parades as their uh, as the example he wanted to give of uh, the killer app for uh, telco video. I, I don't know whether that was because their best idea or because he was playing it close to the vest. But what's your best idea now? Well, the the value proposition for FiOS is it's absolutely by far the high speed service that you can get. Um, it has the best latency, the best quality of service. The, the, the content packages that we do for the video side are, extru are you know, broad reaching. It may not have every uh, 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 HD, prog HD program available, especially in certain markets where uh, some of the MSOs don't allow local, sp uh, won't give up the local sports rights. But in general, the value proposition that we're giving to users is the best one as a, a kind of an insurgent play. So it's a combination of Best service plus a great value proposition. One of the challenges uh, I think IPTV and telco TV providers have is two, twofold. One, there's very entrenched business models in that space, so it's difficult to come and say you're going to do something completely differently because the content providers want to treat you like a cable company, for one. Mm -hmm. And the second one is the cons consumer also has a certain expectation and method of a subscribed TV service. And I, think we, I don't think it would be revolutionary. I think we'll probably gravitate towards unbundling of channels and stuff and uh, pay-per-view over the top. And I think yeah, I think the content owners are, are really, uh, uh, you know, have a much bigger say on how we're going to, you know, unbundling of content and a la carte par purchasing of that. And we're also bundling, you know, trying to do content sharing across different platforms. Uh, and I think, you know, we're, we're clearly want to see, we've got, you know, huge reach with wireless. We've got the absolute best quality network on both wireless and wireline. And so I'm sure we're going to think up some ways to, to leverage that, the service across both platforms. Interest. Um, there was a question from this side, right there, yep. Hi, my name is Mark Bensadoon. I'm the CEO of Newfield Wireless, and we've been working very closely with Verizon Wireless primarily, but also comms, 
for the past 16 years. So I know the organization very well. Um, there's a lot of pride, I think, in differentiated uh, tools, services, uh, network, obviously. Could you comment on the competing desire to have a customized offering and that of investing in a, in a startup or an established company and the need, therefore, you know, if you want to see a return, to have them broadly successful, likely in the same marketplace? Well, I think it depends on the right. The, it depends on the type of startup. We don't we don't put any terms into our into our documents that really say that you've got to give preferential treatment. We feel that the the commercial guys structuring the deals have enough influence to be able to strike the right commercial deal. If they want exclusivity, they're going to negotiate this exclusivity. We don't, we don't need to build that into our investment term sheet. Um, and it, and as I said, it, it depends on the type of startup. Some. Are really uh, you know I can actually look at a uh, a use case from one of our earlier uh, one of our earliest exits was uh, Networks in Motion. They provide they were a software developer that provided the um, uh, turn by turn directions for Verizon Navigator, and um, and they went with us first. We had an, I think a time period of, of of well I made the investment a year before we launched. Um, there was a commercial exclusivity after launch that was negotiated separate. It was a fabulously successful product. It was the most successful mobile application that we'd had other outside of content for for about two or three years. Uh, it's still a ten dollar a month ARPU on that app. Was yeah, it no, it was in a gen so it was just a, gr a great product, a great user feedback, uh, and then the company um, was sold to Telecommunication Systems about two years now, and and we had a great exit on it. So. Um, you know, but there was a lot of, there was, you know, some trouble along the way. There was some uh, service level misses, and so I helped get step in the middle to help negotiate what the, the improvements in the penalty were. So it turns out, though, they didn't have much traction with the other carriers. I think they went with, you know, we were, we were one of the first to market with a solution like that, and, and, you know, in the case of Sprint, they went to, not a, I don't think they went to a, um, a branded solution for a while, and an AT&T was about a year and a half, two years later with their solution and picked a different vendor. But you know, we had a great run with them. They had great success outside the US too in terms of a different sort of product and, uh, and we had a great exit. So it was a win-win from a strategic and a financial side, but, but that was a case where they didn't have great traction with the carrier. So Dan, I'm, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry, I was gonna give another example about cross-carrier stuff. So we have an investment in Zoob, the Star Star Dialing Company. So it's a, it's a, a, a way to do direct response in a really kind of much easier use way than, than um, uh, short codes. So you do star star NFL, you'll get a, res you'll get, uh, which is where uh, Verizon Wireless is a sponsor of, you'll get content uh, directly sent to your device and I encourage you to try that out. Um, they also, but they work with all the carriers and, and they have different promotions and they're, they're working with all the carriers. So that's one where a rising tide is really gonna help everybody because it creates exposure for that type of direct response system and and you know it's generating value within within, within Zoob itself. So my question Dan, it's a, there's a tough question I want to throw up is, is you touched on it with the networks in motion saying they had a they penetrated with Verizon but didn't have similar success with other carriers. So the question is can success with one carrier in a given market be an impediment to success in for the startup with other carriers? Yeah, you know, I uh, you know, we talk. I, we compare notes a lot with Vodafone too. We've made um, competing investments, and and you know, it, it, we, that we it turned out later because our our network guys have just different decision making. So it's, you know, when it comes down, to, I, I don't think the investment per se that we're doing would block uh, another carrier from doing it, and because uh, we recuse ourselves from any discussion about other carriers when we're at a at a board meeting. So I really don't know how how they're doing there, but. Um, uh, you know, the decision making that we're make, you know, I like to think I make good bets on companies mm -hmm. and, and that I'm, I'm buying, the, I'm investing in the best player in that space. And often they do serve other customers, but occasionally, you know, I've, we've got some companies that got shut down. So it's just, it just, it's a kind of a case by case basis of how they can compete. And what I'm trying to do is inform them about our decision making process to color, to help them if they need to sell into it and, um, uh, you know, make wins at other carriers. Good. All right, gentlemen, thank you very much. Okay. Gopal, Dan, thanks a lot for talking okay. with us. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Dan. All right. 